Good afternoon. My name is David Murray. I'm the Associate Director for Prevention at uh, NIH and the Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2024 Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture in Epidemiology. This is part of the NIH Director's Wednesday Afternoon Lecture Series, which I uh, generally describe as the most important lecture series on the campus. Uh, the Gordon Lecture is awarded each year to a scientist who's made major contributions to research or training in the field of epidemiology or in the conduct of clinical trials. The speaker selection is coordinated by the Office of Disease Prevention, and this is the 29th year that ODP has sponsored the Gordon Lecture. The lecture was established in tribute to Robert S. Gordon, Jr. for his dedication to the field of epidemiology and his distinguished service to NIH. Over the course of 30 years, Dr. Gordon served in numerous senior leadership positions, including special assistant to the director and chief advisor for clinical practice and research. Dr. Gordon was an early organizer of efforts to address the emerging problem of HIV AIDS, and he became a key coordinator of uh, AIDS research at NIH. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. The CME code for today is 50125. I'll repeat that in a moment. If you have questions during today's talk and you're watching online, please submit them via the videocast website. You can do so by clicking on the word send live feedback. This feature is just below the video display uh, for the lecture. Uh, those of you who are in the room with us, uh, we will open the microphones uh, for questions at the end of the lecture. And all you have to do is step up to one of the two microphones and, and we'll call on you. We'll open the floor to questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, please feel free to submit questions anytime. You don't have to wait until the end. A video recording of this lecture will be posted on our website, prevention.nih.gov, in approximately two weeks. It will also be available on the NIH Videocast website. Again, the CEME code for today is 50125. Today's speaker is Dr. Leonard Egede. Dr. Egede is a general internist, a tenured professor of medicine, and the inaugural Milwaukee Community Chair in Health Equity Research at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He is also chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine and director of the Center for Advancing Population Science. As a nationally recognized health disparities researcher, Dr. Egede's research focuses on developing and testing innovative interventions to reduce and or eliminate health disparities related to race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and geographic location for chronic medical and mental health conditions. Dr. Gede is currently the principal investigator of five NIH R1s. Not many people can say that. Um, and uh, he has published more than 450 manuscripts documenting how factors at the individual, provider, and system levels influence health outcomes. His work has also examined the impact of structural racism, social determinants of health, and social risk on health outcomes. Advanced research on effectiveness and safety of telehealth and telemedicine as a modality for delivering effective clinical care, and improved understanding of the role of behavioral economics on health and health outcomes for individuals with chronic disease. His presentation is titled, Addressing Health Disparities in Diabetes, Intersection of Structural Racism, Social Determinants, and Racial Ethnic Disparities. Please join me in welcoming the 2024 Robert S. Gordon Jr. Lecture Award recipient, recipient Dr. Leonard Egede. Thank you. Uh, it's definitely an honor to be uh, here to, give, uh, to receive this award, but then also to give this uh, presentation. And, uh, I usually like to start off my presentation by giving context. So I'm an immigrant, uh, moved here in 1995 uh, to the United States, and I've really loved this country. I've, I've had a lot of benefit from being here. But then also just watching uh, over the years, I've seen a lot of gaps in what we could be as a society. So I come to this talk from the perspective of going from good to great. So it's not all bad but there are things we can actually do to get better. So that's kind of the context in which I give. I have no disclosures uh, to give. And really the goal of this talk is to focus on looking at some of the national data related to disparities in diabetes care 
to define health disparities and discuss the intersection of structural racism, social determinants of health, and health disparities, and then discuss some emerging interventions to address social determinants and reduce disparities in clinical outcomes for diabetes. I have studied diabetes my whole career, but that's not the only thing I've studied, but I found diabetes to be a very good uh, marker for a lot of the work that we actually do because it's very prevalent. Uh, you have uh, biologic measures that are easy to track, but then also you have social factors that drive a lot of the outcome. So very good uh, uh, for us to actually work in that space. And so I'm going to go over the overview of diabetes. Uh, this is for those who are not familiar with diabetes. Uh, so you look at prevalence. Uh, you know, about almost 15% of the, of the U.S. population have uh, uh, diabetes. In the earlier days, we used to talk about undiagnosed diabetes, and those numbers are getting uh, 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 less and less and uh, as we do better work at, at tracking. But again, you have uh, it's still about 3% of individuals who are undiagnosed. But then when you look at diabetes by race, uh, you see that there are differences by racial groups. And so uh, race and ethnicity... Uh, if you look at white non-Hispanic, it's about 13, about 14 percent, and you look at black non-Hispanic, about 17 and a half percent, Asian non-Hispanic, almost 17 percent, and Hispanic, about 16 percent. So you see gaps in prevalence of disease by uh, by race. And so now I just want to talk about what is how disparities and some some language that's really important to ground us. And so uh, most people now are very familiar with the concept of race as a social construct. Uh, when I was in training, uh, we treated race as biology, and we all begin to recognize that there's a, a very big difference in seeing race as a social construct versus seeing it as a biological construct. So these are some of the things that are really important for us to lay the foundation uh, for the talk. But the other thing that's also important is ethnicity. So we talk about race, ethnicity, as if that makes it better. When you look at ethnicity, uh, if you look at the word Hispanic, it includes over 400 million people from, from many different ethnic groups in more than 20 different countries. So if you're lumping people together with so, so much very, uh, uh, variability, it really uh, uh, begs the question, what are you actually measuring? But this is the best measure we have right now, so we have to find ways to make this actually work. And then culture is also a big part of that conversation. What is culture? How does culture play out? And many of the things we're describing, our diet, our physical activity levels, are actually connected to our culture and cultural values. So again, just important to separate those uh, terms as we go forward. The next thing is, uh, what do we mean by disparities, differences, and discrimination? Because everybody assumes they all mean the same thing, but they're actually very different. And so if you, if you look at this, this is a slide that's actually very helpful in helping understand what does it really mean. So when you take two groups, uh, non-minority and minority group, and there's something that's different, let's say prevalence of disease, all you can say at that point is there's a difference. And differences do not really mean anything until you actually begin to uh, delve into what are the differences due to. So when the difference is due to clinically appropriate, uh, appropriateness and patient preferences, then that's a difference, and it's actually not bad. It's neither bad nor good. Once it becomes tied to the operation of the healthcare system and legal and regulatory climate, then you start talking about a disparity. And then when you have discrimination, bias, and prejudice, stereotyping, and uncertainty, then that is discrimination. So discrimination and disparity are one, are one category differences explains everything. So whenever you say there's a difference between groups, the first question is, is this different due to appropriateness? Is it clinically appropriate for that difference to exist? If that's the case, then it's just a difference. But when you start uh, drilling down to biases and things like that, you start talking about discrimination. So it's really important because many times we actually use the terminology as if they're all interchangeable, and then we actually then do not clarify what we mean with some of these terms. So now I want to go over social determinants of health, uh, which is um, the first time we started working on social determinants was with my PhD students uh, in, uh, uh, in 2010. And at that time, we were just early phase of social determinants. We actually didn't have good measures. And now we have all of these great measures. So what are social determinants? The WHO defines social determinants as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels. Now, many people use the word social determinants to mean uh, as if it's something bad. It's actually, social determinants are not bad. It's the social risk 
that follow social determinants that are really the issue. So I think being able to understand these differences allows us to call and be very clear what we mean when we say, when we use the word social determinants. People say, I'm measuring social determinants, and the question, what are you measuring? You need to be very clear, what exactly are you measuring? So this is a conceptual framework that has really, from the WHO, that's really defined how we think about social determinants. There's this framework, there's also the CDC framework, but this is the framework we use because it's a very, it's a great organizing framework for some of these issues. So if you look at, if you go from, uh, from uh, your, uh, my right uh, to, your, to the left, so you go from impact on, uh, so at the individual level, you go backwards, you see material circumstance, behaviors, and psychosocial factors, you have the health system, you go backwards, you look at socioeconomic position, social class, education, occupation, and income, and then you go even further back, you start seeing things like governance, macroeconomic policies, social policies. And so what's important is to recognize that we spend a lot of time at the individual level, and we don't pay attention to the fact that upstream factors drive individual differences. And so the more I've done this work now, I found that I spent a lot of, I spent the first decade of my career just focused on the individual level. And you realize you do all these interventions, there are still these factors you can't explain. And so now we're beginning to move backwards and asking ourselves, how do we begin to have impact at that next level? So I'm just going to share with you some of the work I've done over time. Uh, I have had a very good team. Um, I, I really believe in working in teams, and I've had mentees who have actually contributed to all this work. And many of the things I'm presenting are some of the PhD work of some of my mentees very early on in their career. So this is one study that we did where we took about uh, 650 individuals with type 2 diabetes, and we did a very detailed assessment of social determinants of uh, health factors, and we broke them into psychosocial, built environment, uh, you know, and multiple other aspects. And I remember that study, because uh, uh, Dr. Walker was one of the individuals, uh, they were recruiting patients from the uh, university, from the VA, from the community, and uh, the surveys were really long. We had about 70-page survey just to capture all of this information. And, but what we also wanted to do was go beyond regular regression and begin to ask questions using a little bit more sophisticated approach, a structural equation modeling, where you could actually look at path. What is the pathway for this? And what we actually found very quickly was that we actually found that in, in this conceptual framework, you could actually see the drivers of glycemic control and how processes of care, access to care, and self-care actually played a role. But then these other factors, these psychosocial factors, actually had direct effect. And so this was one of the early studies that actually began to raise the question that social factors were actually important because when I was training, I was told it was all about biology, you know, just uh, take your medications and things will go well. And we're beginning to see now that there's a lot more than just taking medications. There's the environment, there are all these other factors. How does depression play a role? Social support. And so we're actually beginning to demonstrate that these factors actually are independent of our usual pathways. And this was one of the first studies that showed that. And then one of my other uh, mentees, uh, Dr. Dawson, uh, actually, well, this was a study where we were looking at discrimination. And at that time, the question was, well, we know there's discrimination. It actually impacts you, but how does it do it? What is the mechanism? And so this was, again, another study using very similar methodology where we actually identified, we hypothesized that dis discrimination would actually impact stress and that stress would impact self-care and your glycemic control, and that's what we actually found in the study. But what we actually found was that social support buffered that relationship, and so the people who had good, strong social support actually did better, and that social cohesion, your neighborhood cohesion, also made a difference. So stress was one of the pathways, but stress also had a two pathways, one through self-care, and the other directly on glycemic control. So again, raising questions about how do we begin to uh, factor how does discrimination lead to poor outcomes and some of these are pathways we can actually study. And then I had uh, um, a, a student now who is uh, who's in medical school now who actually was looking at this and the next question was let's look at mental health. And again, very similar pathway and what we found was uh, that stress actually led to poor mental health. So not just physical health, but poor mental health, but social support mitigated that, uh, that effect and actually uh, uh, you know, buffered some of that effect. So again, showing you that in people with diabetes, uh, uh, some of these factors actually played a role. 
And then the next thing we actually uh, began to look at was uh, looking at food insecurity. And so Dr. Walker right there is uh, an associate professor, and she does, has an R01 looking at some of these areas. But at that time, she was a, a doctoral student, and she was asking the question, how does food insecurity impact diabetes control? And you can imagine in that era, uh, everything was about self-care. And what this study actually showed was that uh, food insecurity actually uh, was associated with depression, fatalism, stress, and diabetes distress, and then had an impact on A1C, and that some of those pathways were direct pathways and others were indirect through self-care. And so this was one of the first studies that actually demonstrate that food insecurity had a direct relationship with glycemic control that was independent of self-care. And again, raising the question, then what do we actually do? And then the last uh, study, uh, it turns out my son was doing the summer program with us, and uh, he, uh, so he picked up this project, so something that was very in of interest to him, uh, neighborhood factors. And the question was, how do neighborhood factors really impact glycemic control in individuals with uh, diabetes? And so you can see, we hypothesized at that time that violence, discrimination, and crime in the neighborhood would lead to stress, and stress was uh, uh, affected self-efficacy and you persist self-efficacy, which led to poor uh, uh, self-management and then glycemic control, and all those pathways are actually validated. So you can see uh, when you have violence in the community, stress levels are very high, discrimination stress levels are very high, crime stress is high, stress leads to poor self-efficacy, and poor self-efficacy leads to poor uh, self-care, and self-care then leads to glycemic control. But then you have all of these indirect pathways uh, uh, from crime to self-efficacy. So again, raising the question or raising the, uh, or presenting the idea that we need to start thinking about neighborhoods and that neighborhoods actually matter. And that we, if we want to really get good control, we need to pay attention to what uh, those things are. So we did all these studies very early on for the first couple of years, and then we realized, well, now we have these pathways. What do we do? Uh, how do you address this issue? And so this coincided with about the time I moved to, all of this work was done when I was in Charleston, uh, the Medical University of South Carolina. Then we moved to Milwaukee, and we were faced with a, a, a problem. Uh, all the time we were in South Carolina, most of the work was about rural minorities. And then we came to Milwaukee, and it was about urban challenges. And so we, we spent two years, first two years, doing a lot of deep work in the community, we did about 350 focus groups. We did stakeholder interviews. We actually were asking questions about, and the goal was to ask the question, given what we know, what types of interventions will actually work in this environment? And so the very first study we got funded uh, came out of conversations with community members, and we're asking the question. We're actually at the senior center, and the, and the women said, you know, our real problem is social isolation. And we don't have, you know, wouldn't it be nice if someone could come from your team and educate us about diabetes, so we don't have to come to the hospital. And then we can actually get a, a team together, and that will really allow us to build community. So we, uh, we kind of thought it through, uh, distilled the idea, and wrote this grant uh, to NIDDK, and we actually got it funded. And this study is just finishing up now. We, we randomized about 200 individuals. Originally, the plan was a cluster randomized design. We're taking 30 uh, senior centers and, random, and randomizing people by centers. But when the pandemic hit, we had to convert this to one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one interventions, we actually uh, uh, changes. So we are, we are right now at the point where we are uh, doing some of the initial analysis to see. Uh, and the idea was if we could take people and provide them with just, not just diabetes education, but social needs, you know, housing, transportation, and assessing what could we do to help you. Uh, the goal of this was not to fix their social needs was to really help them find resources. What's out in the community? What could you actually do? And doing that together with diabetes education to see if it actually had an impact on clinical outcomes. And we use uh, something called behavioral activation, which is a, uh, a psychosocial approach that actually allows you to increase ac activity and really build, uh, help people build resilience. And so we actually use this as our intervention, and this is pending uh, some results now. The next one that came about was we were doing one of these, again, we went to a food pantry, we were having this conversation about, so how do you deal with food? And, uh, and the people said, well, you know, uh, people come in and ask us to go to, uh, you know, to farmer's market. Well, people like us don't go to farmer's market. It doesn't really work for us. So we said, well, what would work for you? Well, wouldn't it be nice if someone could actually give us, uh, uh, send, deliver stock boxes? And then someone said, well, well you know, stock boxes will not be enough. What about vouchers? 
And then someone else said, well, what if you did both? Can you guys do both? So I said, well, we can do anything you want us to do. Just tell us what you think is going to work. We will figure out the science. And so we sat down and we came up with this idea of a two-by-two two factorial design where we're actually comparing one group just got diabetes. Everyone got diabetes education. The second group got stock boxes mailed to them. The third group got uh, 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 vouchers uh, they actually got for the same amount. And the fourth group got both, but half of each. And uh, we actually uh, did this, and we randomized people. We partnered with um, Hunger Task Force to actually provide the stock boxes. So we actually didn't have to pay for them, because this is actually something that the government already provides as part of U USD uh, um, support for food. And we randomized these individuals. And the first thing we realized halfway into the study was the people, uh, uh, community members began to say, you know, these boxes are too heavy. Uh, it's not convenient. And I don't really like what's in the, uh, in the box. And when I try, because one of the things I, I believe in is before I ask people to do something, I want to make sure that I'm comfortable. So I took the store box home uh, at the very beginning of the study, and I actually tried to eat what was in the box. And no one in my house would eat it. Uh, <laughs> the cereal wasn't really great. The cheese was. So I, real, I realized then and then that what was going into those boxes was really not ideal. And so, but we'd already randomized people, and we were going to finish. So what I said to the individuals was, we're going to finish this study, but we've learned from this feedback, and we're going to incorporate it into the next studies we're actually doing. So this study was finishing up, and uh, uh, one of my mentees then picked up, she had a kick, uh, is, uh, ADA grant, and we actually used that to do uh, an intervention. We're actually testing a different approach. So we now have a better sense of that these boxes don't really work. And what people are telling us is what they want is, I don't want the stigma of showing up with uh, a voucher. Why can't I just get a card that looks like that nobody can tell what's in it? And so we're actually giving people now cards and so you can actually go to the grocery store and shop without having to feel like they, uh, everybody knows that they're food insecure or they're getting a weak card or things like that. So these, are, these studies actually now, we just finished up, we're kind of in that analysis phase. So these are all wrapping up, uh, you know, five-year studies that are just wrapping up. The third study was uh, very interesting because this was, uh, when, I, when we're in Charleston, uh, we we're trying to figure out how do we motivate people to get behavior change. And we had done a couple of studies uh, you know, one of the things you, you realize is you learn more from field studies uh, than you actually do for studies that succeed. So we've done a couple of two-hour ones, and we just got results that were not inconclusive about education. And so in, in discussing, I said, you know, we had, that was about the time when behavioral economics was coming up. So we said, well, let's do a pilot to see if giving people financial incentives will actually make a difference. We did the pilot with 60 African-Americans. a one since dropped about almost 3%. I was like, wow, this is about the, uh, the largest drop I've ever seen in my whole time doing behavioral intervention. So we wrote this R01 with the idea to actually provide incentives, and we are called these structured incentives. And the idea is to get people to go from using incentives to move from extrinsic motivation, and eventually it will transition to intrinsic motivation. So we, we randomized people to this design, and we wanted to test. We had, we had already tested the home telemonitoring intervention. And the goal was to layer this incentive on top of that home telemetry intervention. So we randomized people one-to-one, uh, uh, -one, but we also wanted to look at race effects. So we actually randomized people to intervention versus control. So the, it was actually two interventions, home telemetry alone and home telemetry uh, plus structured incentive. And then we actually asked the question, we stratify by race. Because the question was, it appears that in, uh, financial incentives may actually function differently by racial group and we didn't know, have that information. So we, we stratified by, by race, and so we had uh, uh, white, uh, 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 black, and then Hispanic. But the other thing we also said was, what will happen if we stop the intervention? Do we really have people converting from extrinsic to uh, intrinsic? So we actually stopped the intervention at 12 months, and we followed them for 18 months, uh, to another six months. So that study is probably the longest. We randomized 450 people. That's about the largest we've actually done to date, and we just finished the, we're finishing up the 18-month uh, phase right now. And some of the preliminary studies suggest that the incentives actually work, and that we're going to try to see uh, whether the racial differences, whether the races actually respond differently to incentives in terms of how this is actually done. So this is pending uh, results right now, but we're almost uh, ready to start an uh, analysis. And then, uh, right about that, uh, when we're finishing up this, uh, you know, uh, George Floyd, uh, 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 you know, uh, the death of George Floyd, the conversation about this, and then well, we are also getting to the point where we said, this individual level interventions, 
are not addressing these upstream factors. And so we actually began to look at this WHO framework and we said, okay, there's this whole social, economic, and political context that is typically not talked about. How do we address this? And so I want to walk you through the concept of structural racism, structural inequalities, and some of the work we've done there and what we've actually found in our research. So these are the two definitions that most people uh, is widely accepted right now in terms of definition of structural racism. One is the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing inequitable systems that in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources. And the second is organized systems within societies that cause avoidable and unfair inequalities in power, resources, capacities, and opportunities across racial or ethnic groups. Now, um, you know, we use the word structural inequalities as the overarching framework. And when those structural inequalities are tied to race, it becomes structural racism. So, you know, I was telling uh, uh, some of the people I met with earlier that structural uh, inequalities is global. It's not a U.S. phenomenon. It's all over the world. It's about wealth. And, and, uh, but then when it's actually focused on race, then it becomes structural inequality and structural racism, and that's kind of what we uh, are addressing here. But there are two concepts. This is from the work of um, Richard Rustin, The Color of Law, the concept of de facto and de jure. And de facto is true, in fact, but not officially sanctioned. The result of private practice and personal preference or individual choice, not the result of law or government policy. Whereas the jury is sanctioned by law and public policy. And the idea is that without government and law, private prejudice has far less opportunity for expression and it's not reinforced through judicial decisions and policies based on prior law. So this is the concept of, when you talk, call it structural, these are things that are embedded in, in our society, in systems. And that these systems have a way of actually perpetrating themselves. So when people say, well, let, let the past be the past, it's really not true, because the past influences the present. If you understand law, that you always base decisions based on prior judicial decisions. So if you don't address the prior judicial decisions, then you're going to continue to, uh, to carry forward some of these injustices. So here are some examples of structural racism, housing and residential segregation due to historic redlining, and I'm going to talk about redlining shortly. Uh, funds flow for education. When you base education on tax structure, then it, it guarantees that rich neighborhoods will always have better educational systems than poor neighborhoods. Uh, you know, the idea of station sanctioned violence, where people are actually killed uh, uh, and, and uh, police stops, police uh, killings that happen, and where nothing is actually done uh, as part of trying to bring about change. Mass incarceration, this is getting better now, but we actually had a time when about 37% of African-American men without a high school diploma were incarcerated. So this is a large uh, portion. Then the judicial system, where depending on how rich you are, how wealthy you are, you can actually expunge your records, and if, you have, you can, if you're not that wealthy, you can't. But then also, in terms of uh, differential uh, sentencing based on race and some of these factors that drive it. And then the other thing that most people don't realize is that one of the uh, most important ways to accumulate wealth is by home ownership. And so when you have people who had uh, generations where they couldn't own homes, you create a wealth gap that is still present today. So if you look at our society today, about 85% of the wealth is in white households and about 4.2% in African-American households and 3% in Latino or Hispanic households. So again, you see differential wealth. Uh, and wealth is very different from income because income is essentially what you make now. Wealth is cumulative and it's what is in your family and what you've actually had over time. So now I want to switch gears and talk about some of our work. Uh, so obviously when we got, uh, uh, got on this path, we said to ourselves, okay, what do we do to create meaningful research that will help us understand the issues, but then also that will actually get uh, people, get us targets for intervention, just like what we did with social determinants. We, we did the initial work pathways, and we said here are the targets. So here we are doing some work now. The very first study we did was published in Diabetes Care in 2022 with, my, uh, uh, with uh, three of my mentees. And the idea was to look at redlining and present-day diabetes uh, uh, mortality and years of life loss. And what's fascinating about this was that, um, you know, many people may not be familiar with this. Uh, redlining is, is the previous legal practice of systematically denying credit access and insurance to residents of specific neighborhoods. 
It was formalized in 1934 by the Federal Housing Administration and was later prohibited by the Fair Housing Act of 1960. So it's illegal to actually redline today. And what does that redline come from? So what they did at that time was they had what was called the Homeowners Loan Corporation and they graded neighborhoods based on what they talked about viability. So uh, A was considered best and was colored green. B was still desirable, was colored blue. And C was declining, was colored yellow. And D was hazardous and was colored red. If you, were, if you were red, you didn't get resources, you couldn't build, you couldn't buy, you couldn't actually invest in those neighborhoods. So this is the concept of redlining, because of that red. Uh, red. And so uh, uh, cities that actually uh, have those redlining maps, you can actually see that most of the inner cities, most of the uh, marginalized neighborhoods are in those red zones even today. Now, there's some overlap, but still about the same. And so what we wanted to do was to ask the question, what's the relationship between historic redlining and age standardized mortality and years of life loss for people with diabetes? And we use multiple data sets. And one of the things, uh, because of my background and training in health services, uh, we're able to work with national data, large data, small data. And so this was uh, where we actually took data from, uh, you know, the only, uh, at the time when we did this work, there was only one county in, uh, in, uh, in Washington that had enough data to allow us to actually do this analysis. And so we, that, was, that was from Seattle. So we took the Hawk map from the city of Seattle, and we, looked, uh, we used census track ship files from uh, 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 the Census Bureau, and then we came up with 109 census tracks for each of the 25 years of outcomes. We wanted to follow people forward in time, 1990 to 2014. But this is what we found. So the first panel is uh, 1990, the second panel is uh, uh, 20, uh, um, uh, 2014. The top uh, is uh, uh, death and the other is years of life lost. And what you see is almost a linear relationship between hot grade, so one is green and four is hazardous and increased mortality. But what was more consist concerning for us was not just the fact we, are, we knew this was what we were going to find in terms of the expectation, it was persistence. So you look at 1990 and 2014, the effects are still very similar. What this is saying is that what all of those effects that we had in the 1960s are still carrying forward today, and you're still having some of those uh, effects. So again, this is uh, something that really got us thinking about, okay, now if this is true, uh, then what else do we need to actually pay attention to? So the next study we did was a study where we were trying to understand what's been done in the literature uh, and so we actually did a scoping review uh, looking at structural racism as an upstream social determinant of health. And I'm not going to go into this. This is the abstract. But what we wanted to actually do was to actually take uh, the literature using the WHO model and ask the question, those upstream factors, what's been done in the literature, how many studies? So we did a re reproducible search of Medline. And we actually looked at uh, uh, all articles published from the beginning of the database to July of two, uh, 2022. And we used this framework, the WHO framework, to actually classify studies. And then we, have, we found a total of 441 studies that we actually identified. And then we really narrowed down to 54 that actually had enough information. And ultimately, we're down to 10 studies that actually had any kind of measurable relationship. And what did we find? One, there's positive work in that space. But two, that uh, for those studies that actually had data, there was a very strong relationship between structural racism and poor diabetes outcomes and mortality. So again, uh, suggesting that there was something uh, uh, going on. So it was poor clinical outcomes, worse self-care behaviors, lower standards of care, higher mortality, and more years of life lost. But the main issue to date is there are no pathways. We can't create interventions without understanding the mechanism and the pathways. And so we then started, uh, and this was right about uh, 20, last, uh, 2023, we sat down and we said, well, how do we even answer this question? If we, and obviously at this level you need a data, not at the individual level, more about census track. So we decided to do this uh, last study that just got published this year, uh, looking at historic real learning and impact of structural racism on diabetes prevalence in a nationally representative sample of U.S. adults. And so what did we do? We used redlining as a surrogate. And I always tell people, redlining is not structural racism. It's a, an expression of structural racism. So it's, not, it's, the, it's one of the measures we have. It's not the best measure, but it gives us some sense of what is going on. And we wanted to investigate the direct and indirect relationships between redlining and prevalence of diabetes. 
And for those uh, of us who do interventions, uh, we're not satisfied with finding results. We want to find explanatory models. How do we actually fix this? So we're coming at this with the mindset of what are mutable factors, what are policies that could actually be changed, and what would that look like? So we took data from very similar to what we, we did, uh, CDC places data for prevalence, HOC a grade from uh, the Mapping Inequality Project, and we actually used um, a really nice work that was being uh, put together, which uh, looking at conceptual framework, and we have actually done that work in terms of conceptual framework, and then we had adjusted for the census tract population based on census data. So we had about almost 9,600 census tracts across the United States, and we, we used this whole methodology for using whole grade, because when you have overlap, uh, historic uh, grade versus new, uh, new uh, data, we actually we assign an aggregate score. So if you, if you are one plus two, we take the average, it becomes 1.5. So that allows us to account for overlap. You know, if you are red before, now you're kind of green. What does that really mean? And we're able to actually account for that. And we use structural equation modeling as a methodology for doing this. But I want to talk to you about how we got to the framework. So I said when we arrived in Wisconsin, we actually I got uh, some funding from uh, our Advancing Healthy Wisconsin Foundation, and it gave us about almost $3 million to look at data in the inner city of Milwaukee, 10 zip codes. And so we did a very deep dive into those zip codes. We did about 30 focus groups, 60 stakeholder interviews. We interviewed about 350 community members and leaders. And then we actually did a survey of about 2,400 individuals, very deep assessment of social risk, clinical outcomes, and across the board. And when we got done, our goal, it was a mixed method study, so we're trying to understand what drives some of these differences from the community perspective plus what we have actually found. And this is a paper we published about the conceptual framework. And we actually argued that structural racism expressed as redlining led to discrimination, high incarceration rates, high poverty, residential segregation, substance use disorders, housing instability, food insecurity, lower educational attainment and unemployment, and this led to poor health and disability. And we actually introduced the concept of human capital because sick people do not contribute to society. And so you actually have a decreased human capital when people are sick and when people are actually not doing very well. So this we published this in uh, 2021 as a, a framework for how to address this. So we use that same framework now for, the, uh, for this particular paper. And so what we did was we actually asked the question, are there direct and indirect relationships between redlining and some of these uh, factors? And what you can see is that all of them, redlining was high incarceration, high poverty, high discrimination, uh, substance use disorder, housing instability, education, unemployment, food access. And then those factors then led to increased diabetes prevalence, and there was a residual direct effect from redlining to diabetes prevalence. So why is this important? This gives us actionable uh, targets. We can actually begin to say, if you want, really want to do something, here are some areas you can actually focus on based on the stress of association and based on uh, what can be muted, uh, what's mutable at the population level, because this is not individual level. This is really, if you took a zip code, what could you actually do at the zip code uh, level? So what are we doing now? Uh, we are now at the point where we're asking ourselves, okay, we have some of this general sense, but what do we really do and what is the next uh, frontier? So we have two hour ones right now, uh, the multiple peer with, uh, with uh, one of my mentees, and the first one is looking at uh, uh, structural racism and disparities in social risk, human capital, healthcare resources, and health outcomes. I would call it a multi-level analysis of pathways and policy levels. We're very particular about not just showing relationships, we're asking ourselves the question, so this is a, a, a five-year hour one funded by NIMHD to really look at using uh, national data at the census track, tracking all of these measures, and so the first goal is to look at the relationship some of which we already know. The second is to look at direct and indirect effects. And then the third is to actually look at policies. What are the policies that are actionable at the, at the federal, state, and regional governments that can be used to reduce vulnerabilities? And then finally, to engage stakeholders. I want to be able to get people to prioritize based on the data and say what are the top three to five interventions that really make a difference from the right key stakeholders so that we can actually have uh, a blueprint for people to actually work uh, going forward. So this study is uh, ongoing. This is uh, we're in the second year of this. We're just collecting data now. The data is just humongous, and we're just trying to kind of clean it up and get it together. 
But the second uh, grant is a grant as, as, uh, with the same uh, individual where we're looking at structural racism on hospital and clinic closures, community access, and health outcomes. Again, this is really a very different perspective in saying that we're looking at these factors and how, if you look at most inner city environments, you have absence of health care, and the pandemic even made it worse. And so our goal is to actually look at regional exposure to re uh, structural racism and the propensity for hospital and clinic closures. So are we disinvesting in communities that actually have, uh, you know, that uh, were formerly redlined? And then we're also looking at what does that do to the neighborhood? So hospitals actually uh, drive the economy of the environment. They hire a lot of people. Most hospitals are the highest employers in the area. So when you close the hospital, you create, you actually take away jobs. You take away opportunities. And so all of these things create a cascading effect in terms of neighborhood. And then we want to look at the ability to predict risk of closure. So can we actually anticipate hospitals that are about to close or clinic closure in those environments, and can we mitigate those closures uh, uh, before they actually happen? And then finally, to actually create, again, stakeholder engagement uh, where we can actually use uh, you know, uh, policy dialogue approaches to identify strategies to really help us address uh, future impact. And for most of my research, a key part of that is always the idea, can we do something about it? It's not just enough to, to tell people there's some, a problem, what can we do about it, and give some potential solutions uh, going forward. And so, uh, in conclusion, uh, I think I'm, I'm doing well in terms of time. Yeah, so in conclusion, Social determinants of health are key drivers of poor diabetes outcomes. This is pretty much conclusive that we know, and it's been well documented, that structural racism is antecedent to social determinants and is a strong driver of poor diabetes outcomes. I think this is a part that sometimes is missing. We're so focused on social determinants, we don't pay attention to the upstream factors. And so we're trying to make people aware that these upstream factors drive social determinants, and that redlining has significant direct and indirect relationship with diabetes prevalence. And the key emphasis of ongoing research should be to identify direct and indirect pathways and identify targeted interventions. What can be done? And we believe that policy interventions are needed to address upstream structural racism to improve diabetes outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two microphones in the aisle, so I would encourage members of the audience to step up to a microphone if you have a question. We'd be happy to let you ask your question and uh, get an answer. So please. Uh, hello, my name is Rebecca Prevo. I'm at, I'm at NIAD. Thank you so much for that excellent talk on the overview of, of the history of current effect of structural racism. Um, in terms of interventions, you mentioned that an intervention could be stakeholders trying to prevent the closure of community hospitals and areas. I'm curious whether you've um, had success with that or know of success with that either in where you were before, I think you said South Carolina or we're in, the, in Wisconsin. Yeah. And I had a second question, but yeah. Okay, so I think, um, uh, so the, the strategy is now, we actually we had a similar situation that just happened in Wisconsin where one of the inner city hospitals was about to be closed. And from a business standpoint, it made sense for the health system, that particular health system to close out. But the community rose up and said, this is about the only safety net hospital we have. If you close this down, people are not gonna have access. Because of community uh, uh, activism, that hospital is still open. Mm. And so people actually came together and it became very clear that, uh, because sometimes when you're making business decisions, people are not paying attention to what is the impact on communities. And this, uh, getting the, the group together to actually provide evidence. And so what they ended up doing, the compromise was, we'll move some programs that are not viable mm -hmm. and we're gonna keep others. And that allowed them to actually keep that hospital open. That's great, that was in Wisconsin? Or? Yes, uh, Wisconsin. That's fantastic. You're welcome. Um, a second question relates to food deserts and your, your first uh, study where you were looking at interventions related to sending boxes of food or giving vouchers. I know in the social epi literature, there's a lot of discussion of, of, um, of food deserts. I'm curious, in those neighborhoods, are they, are they food, uh, are you sending boxes of food because the senior citizens can't get out to the grocery store, or whatever, or, is, or are they in food deserts, or is it a little of both? It's a little bit of both. So you have, uh, you have a situation where uh, some neighborhoods, uh, it will take you about, on the bus route, maybe almost two hours to get to the nearest uh, grocery store. 
And then in other areas, uh, these are older individuals where they don't feel safe going around, and then many of them actually do not have transportation. So getting around becomes challenging to actually do that. And, but the other thing that's also important is that uh, if you look at most of these neighborhoods, right, you have corner stores uh, where the food is not fresh. It's really not. So they really don't have, you may have something in your neighborhood, but it's not the place that you, most of us will actually want to shop in. And so the, what many of the uh, community members are saying is this is not healthy. We, we actually know, the more we're educated, the more we realize this is not good for us. But how do we get to healthy food and how do we get access to those uh, healthy options? Great. I wish you success in those uh, studies and interventions. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Um, Roland Owens, Office of Vitrum Rural Research. Um, so both low um, socioeconomic status and low numeracy are associated with poor glycemic control. Have you looked at um, financial literacy education as an intervention? You're right on, you're right on target. So one of the things we, we, we actually do after every study that we do, we do focus groups at the end of the study really to understand what worked, what did not work, what could we have done differently, and what lessons did we learn from it beyond the quantitative component. And one of the things that's coming up a lot now is the, the desire to have financial literacy education. Now, what we are realizing is uh, when you call it financial literacy, uh, 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 community members uh, think you're trying to manage your finances. So you have to uh, uh, create a terminology that allows them to feel comfortable. And what many of them are actually asking, in some of our focus group, a woman said, no one told me about credit. You know, uh, they keep offering you these credit cards, and at the end of the day, they say your, your credit score goes down. So why are they offering you credit cards if, they, if it's going to actually ding your credit, card, uh, your credit? And so going through the explanation of understanding what does it even mean to have what, 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 are, what is credit, what do credit cards do, then issues around things as simple as budgeting. Right? How much do you actually spend? And so a participant said, I didn't realize, uh, you know, uh, uh, how much these things actually cost until I really got it. Because we, when we, uh, the, uh, the question they were asking was, so how do you know and how, who, who educates you? And that's part of what we need to actually begin to do. So it's really very customized. And for some people, it would actually vary. We can have to create menus so people can actually pick and choose what they actually need to know in terms of financial literacy. Thank you. Other questions in the room? I think there's someone over there. Yes. Hi, Jane Simone, Director of OBSSR here at NIH. Great talk. Um, I love looking at wider, broader structural factors. As a clinical psychologist, we're trained so much to look at the individual factors. Um, but it's harder when you look at these bigger problems uh, to address. And you said, um, I think correctly, that the next step is kind of policy changes to look at these things. There's no individual counseling. We're not going to talk to a person and solve racism. Any ideas from all this great work you've done so far about where these initial policy changes might be the most effective? Yes. So we, we have actually played around with uh, using data, right, to do. Uh, so in, uh, one of my um, mentees is a uh, collaborator now is a health economist and who is very well trained in this. So we, difference in difference, right, when you look at the policy intervention and you actually choose controls. So one example is Medicaid adoption. Well, uh, so if you're thinking about a low-hanging fruit, uh, in, we know that access is a big driver. It doesn't matter whether you're on the east uh, on the uh, what political spectrum you are, right, uh, left leaning, it doesn't really matter. People are people, they need access to healthcare. How we get access to healthcare is a political debate, but the key issue is we know that access improves outcomes. And so uh, we actually tested, uh, uh, so one of the greatest drivers of bankruptcy is healthcare. We, call, we actually wrote a paper called Catastrophic Health Expenditures. And so if you don't have insurance, uh, many of you may not know this, when you have insurance, there's what's called a pre-negotiated rate. So if you go to the hospital for two days, three days, they may charge you 50,000, your insurance negotiates that rate down, and maybe they actually end up paying 20,000. Of that 20,000, your co-pay may be 500. When you don't have insurance, you pay the full price. So you are charged you 50,000 and there's no buffer. You can't pre-negotiate. So those individuals now are hit with a, if a, uh, with a bill of 50,000 for someone who actually, if you don't have insurance, it's probably because you don't have the resources to actually uh, have that. So those individuals are hit. So we've shown that uh, those catastrophic expenditures are higher in minority communities, and insurance will be one of those ways. We've also shown that Medicaid adoption, 
that uh, if you look at uh, communities that adopted Medicaid, eviction rates are lower and judgments are lower. What does that mean? People are prioritizing what they spend money on. So if I have, if I have a choice, I'll, if I, because health care, you can't can choose. If you're sick, you're sick. So people are actually using their resources to pay for health care, and as a result, you can't pay for housing. So if you actually create an, uh, access to health care, you decrease some of those. And we've actually demonstrated that in studies. So these are examples of things that actually make sense in terms of uh, very logical ways to address uh, these uh, issues. Yeah, one of, the, one of the difficulties, of course, is that that's a very rational argument, and the world isn't always very rational. Um, the politics. The, the question that we got from Dr. Simone about policy interventions, policy interventions are tough for NIH to support as an intervention approach to try to improve some health condition. Yeah. Uh, those are political processes, yeah. and um, uh, it can be challenging to get a, a, a grant funded if you're going to go out and try to do political work. Yeah, so I, I, think, that, I think that's the a very, very important point. So what we try to focus on is not the politics. It is the health outcome. NIH funds research that improves health. And so what we are focused on, where, so even when we do financial incentives and just, we're not giving people money for the sake of giving them money. We're actually asking, how do we change behavior to improve health outcomes? So that's a scientific question. But if you're just coming out and saying, we're just going to give people money so they can feel better, then that's not a scientific question. So I think how these studies are framed, uh, the next frontier is how do we frame studies that get results that improve health and are within this purview of scientific uh, inquiry. But even that kind of intervention is a hot political potato. We have several states now that are passing laws to forbid communities from passing out money. Yeah, but I can, you know, without a work requirement. Yeah, but I, I think that is important to recognize that, you know, philosophically, even depending on where you stand, I think giving money without. So we use what we call conditional cash transfers. The condition is that there's a health component to it. So it's conditional on you attending classes. It's conditional on you. Uh, improving your health outcomes, eating better. Those conditional uh, uh, transfers are logical and they are tied to health outcomes. Where can measure? I think where, where uh, politicians and the community, uh, those individuals are getting worried is if you give people, and it, actually from economic theory, if you flood the market with, risk, with money, you're going to cause inflation. It's, it's a process, right? So I think what, what people are worried about is how do you do this without it being like you're just giving people money? because then it creates, and that's when that tension comes in. Because no one is actually arguing about, uh, so if you give people money to buy strips, so they can take better care of their diabetes. That's logical. It's, it's tied to an end point. I think it's when you give money, and you just say, no conditions, do whatever you want with it. And you know, that is, I mean, it's viable. It's viable. We, we, we think it's, it's a viable option, but I think from, uh, from funding, NIH funding, I think those are issues that should not be, may not be easy for NIH to fund. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Renee, and I'm a postdoc in the neurological disorders uh, and stroke branch. Um, and my research has been focused a lot on epidemiology relating to stroke and social determinants of health, so I really enjoyed this. Um, my question kind of overlaps with a lot of the questions relating to the policy interventions. But also I'm curious about, in terms of intrinsic motivation in these focus groups, when you're seeing people given different options between whether it's food or education and things that will help them change their health, do you notice that people tend to gravitate towards one or the other? Like, I'm wondering what kind of interventions probably would have the most success in terms of giving people resources or educating them to make better choices in terms of the longevity of the situation? Yeah, so we have, um, I have a mentee right now who has a grant uh, looking at uh, uh, basic income supplementation, right? And uh, we've, so the idea for that study, and uh, obviously it's funded by NI, uh, NIDDK, and what they actually said was for that particular uh, K grant, uh, we'll fund the science and you find other resources for the income, uh, income component. So we actually used, uh, we kind of cobbled resources together. But what we were testing in that study was, uh, we, we looked at uh, uh, conditional and unconditional cash transfer and what will happen, randomize people, and then follow them forward in time, and each person got education. What we found for a lot of, in our focus group, we just, the study just is finishing up right now, in the focus groups, the participants actually said the education was very helpful. 
that you know, I know the money is helpful, but the most important thing I actually took away from that was the education. So we believe that, and when we actually looked at, we looked at our spending. So when we gave out the, uh, the grant, on the condition was we, we got access to the, we gave them bank cards, got us access to the statement. We actually went in and analyzed what the, are they doing with the money, right? People are paying rent, their uh, uh, transportation, they are buying their medication, they are buying strips. So they are actually using the funds for the things that they couldn't do otherwise that's tied to health. Now, um, but what many of them actually said to us was they said, you know, because of the incentive, I came in. But the education really, really helped me. So I think it's really about, so we then have, I have several other mentees now who are working on social needs. Because, so you have social needs navigation, you have social needs uh, um, education, and then you have social needs intervention. We actually provide address the social needs. And all of them have results. It just depends on what you're comfortable with, what resources you have, and how much. So, for example, we know that telling people about social needs is not enough, right? So just saying, here, but what really helps is social needs resolution. And how do, can resolution happen? One is to send them to existing resources. We have all these governmental programs that already exist. You can, give, you can help people with that. But the other part of that is then you can also have people who help them. So, for example, someone who doesn't have insurance. Helping them apply for, uh, uh, for aid that's available to them makes a huge difference. So I think it's just thinking about uh, health research from the, uh, from the standpoint of how do we create a more holistic approach to some of these programs as opposed to having silos where I only do this, I only do that. So we argue that the, guy, the person who is food insecure, is also housing insecure, is probably going to have transportation problems. So rather than just saying, hey, I only do housing, well, can we create a holistic program that actually then plugs people into what they need? Great, thank you. Hi, great talk. Um, my name is Sophie Shaw. I'm visiting the NIH this week. I'm a reproductive ethics researcher at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And I loved what you said when you're talking about the food insecurity study that y'all did. Tell us what will work and we'll figure out the science. And you mentioned several times over the course of your talk when you're in your training that you were taught that race is a biological construct. And obviously from the work you're doing now, you no longer believe that and are working and doing all this fantastic effort to reduce the burdens of structural racism. And I'm wondering kind of what the pivot point was for you and what drove you into this line of work. And I think especially coming from my positionality of Texas where uh, our legislators are rapidly trying to make sure that that's not taught in schools anymore. Uh, and I would just love to hear a little bit about your journey to give this talk today. It was really fabulous. Okay. <laughs> that's it. That's a long question. Yes, give, would, me the, uh, give me the short version. Yes, I'll give you a very, very, uh, so I think uh, coming from Nigeria, uh, I was, my first stop was in Baltimore. I was, I was a resident in Baltimore. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was working in a clinic in downtown Baltimore, and I was surprised. I did not expect to see, you know, I could understand a, a developing country having some of the difficulty. But the things I saw in Baltimore, I was saying to myself, I can't believe this is happening in America. I mean, it was, was shocking to me. So, and then at that time, I, diabetes was something I was kind of really fascinated by. And so it was for me the, co the combination of the experience there and the diabetes I'd already gotten into, and so for me it was a natural. And then I had someone who invested in me, uh, you know, a division chief who said, my first job, he said, we're gonna give you a faculty position, and we're gonna allow you to do a master's in clinical research and uh, get a fellowship training. So I did that, and that just changed my trajectory. But I think it's really a function of that exposure. I realized, and so for my K, uh, look, I was funded by HRQ uh, to give uh, kudos to HRQ. They funded me at the time when health services was pretty much unknown. For my K, one of my mentors was a sociologist. Another was a psychologist. I had a health service. So I had people from non-medical field, and I had an endocrinologist who was my diabetes person. But that exposure got me thinking about there are so many aspects of med uh, that's not taught in medical school that I thought, and one of them was a statistician. So I had this couple together, these men mentors, and that really changed my, my trajectory. Thank you. All right. Um, we have almost 400 people online. Uh, we should give them a chance to ask a question. Okay. Um, what suggestions do you have for researchers looking at female diabetes, already screening for diabetes in pregnancy, but looking at blood sugar issues in polycystic ovarian disease and conditions that look like PCO, PCOS? Yes. So uh, a big issue right now is gestational diabetes. 
And this is becoming even more uh, more problematic because as we have, um, it's, it's highly prevalent in minority communities and the outcomes uh, have long-term impact, right, on risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes and also on the infant. And, and so I think, um, you know, there are groups of individuals who do, I don't do work in that space, but I know there's a lot of advancement in science in terms of screening, early detection, and then treatment. So mo most of the programs we actually use for DPP, uh, diabetes prevention, actually work in women with gestational diabetes. So this will be where I'll go is diet and, uh, and physical activity and just helping people get screened. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Egede for a terrific presentation. I want to th thank the audience for good questions, a lively discussion. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be posting a recording of today's presentation on our website, prevention.nih.gov, in the next few weeks. It will also be available on the, on the NIH videocast site. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining today's lecture. For those of you who are here at, in Lipset, uh, please join us outside uh, the auditorium for a brief reception. And to those online, um, if you were here, you could be part of the reception and hang out with our speaker. <laughs> Uh, so I would encourage you to come in person uh, next time, help us fill the room. You also have a better crack at asking questions if you're in the room. Um, finally, the CME code, uh, I've been asked to repeat, 50125. Thank you very much.